so so today what we're going to do is we're going to um I'm going to tell you a bit about the different steps involved in um, designing a show because it's quite a quite a big process that involves a lot of uh, working with lots of different people in the team. Um, we're going to learn a bit of theatre terminology along the way because um, uh, there's lots of uh, weird names for things that we'll sort of find out about. Um, and then uh, towards the end, we're going to come up with, um, I'm going to give you a bit of text and we're going to come up with some ideas about how we might approach um, a design. So I'm not going to be designing anything, but we're sort of going to be talking about in groups about, um, yeah, some uh, initial kind of concepts. Um, and then at the end, um, I can answer any questions that anybody's got um, about the design or, um, or just theatre collaboration in general. Um, so I'm just going to start with, um, I'll tell you a bit about my journey into design. So um, I actually from really young, um, I was up in school, I was doing drama and art and textiles. And I was really desperate to do all, find a job that did used all of those um, subjects. Um, and so uh, I think I was about 16 and I said, I'm going to go to Wimbledon School of Art and I want to be a theatre designer. Um, I don't know why I just got that idea in my head and then that's exactly what I ended up doing so um, I did an arts foundation I'm originally from Leeds um, although I'm in York right now um, in my little studio um, so yeah I did an art foundation in Leeds um, and, which is like a one-year course and then I applied to Wimbledon um, and got in doing a theatre design course um, so that was three years and that was it was quite fine art based so um, we were sort of learning about um, I guess it, it was very like kind of conceptual based and we were sort of dreaming crazy ideas and, and the tutors were letting us design with like imaginative crazy huge budget so I was doing opera design with limited budgets and making model boxes and doing designs uh, but of course, in the real world, <laughs> it's, particularly when you first graduate, it's um, it's a bit more uh, working on a shoestring and being really inventive or what you can do with not much money and not much budget and basically whatever you can kind of find. Um, so you learn all sorts about um, how to fabricate anything from laying a carpet to painting a set to making a costume. You kind of learn all those little bits of skills at the beginning. And then as you um, do more shows, get more experience and kind of, uh, you know, like I've, I've been designing for about 12 years now, um, m along the way, you kind of shed those skills and you give them to other members of the team. Your, the teams that you work with get bigger, the budgets that you get get bigger. Um, so you end up being able to kind of delegate more stuff. Um, so actually what I focus more on now is um, ways to communicate my ideas um, in the best ways possible, which I'll talk about a bit in a second. Um, and, and then uh, kind of watching it all happen and collaborating with the team in order to make that happen. Um, so, um, well, I think what I'll do, I'll start with, I'll just show you some pictures of my work so you can sort of see the, my kind of style. Um, so I think if I just I'm sort of still working with this modern technology <laughs> that we've got, but I think I can share my screen. Brilliant. Okay. So um, I'll just hop through. These are just some images of some shows that I've done. And um, so this is a show that I did with the 154 Collective who are based in uh, Bradford. Um, it was called Rest in the Walrus. Um, this was in the Manchester Royal Exchange. And um, it, it sort of sat in a park on top of a big hill. Um, and all this at the bottom is um, post-it notes um, with little notes written on because it was about dementia. And, and um, uh, dementia sufferers often use um, post-its as memory aids. So that was kind of the, the kind of concept for this. And in the corner, we've got the band that are and that were playing throughout. So they were sort of integrated into the design as well. Um, this is a show called 666 Comments, which was the reading of a comments thread on, a, um, on an online post on Tumblr um, that was about misogyny. And so these two performers uh, read these 666 comments um, 
and uh, it's really funny and really silly um, and that's the comic in the background that's projected and um, this is a show called two um, which is these two performers that do loads of multi-rolling um, throughout so they're constantly doing quick changes um, and um, it's all set in uh, the 80s as well and it's all set in a pub so it's all about the different people that, that visit the pub and this was at the gala theatre in Durham um, this is a production of the elves and the shoemakers that I did for York Theatre Royal and then two years ago and then last Christmas it went to Sheffield Crucible and I'll just show you another picture of that because this set actually opens up so it's a little um, the shoemaker's shop that opens up the roof comes up and it opens up and reveals this look all the interior and all the details of the shop um, so that was like a cute little children's show um, this is a show called um, Instructions for Border Crossings, which and uh, that's Daniel Bai. It's a one man show. Um, and there was lots of in it that were about um, borders and like, security checkpoints and things. So that's what all these security barriers are around the this kind of infinity curve of floor. So it's this kind of very like bureaucratic grey space with these burgundy chairs and this, um, these security barriers that were surrounded by like sort of penning in the performer. And um, this is a show of Handbagged, which um, is about um, the Queen's relationship with Margaret Thatcher and all the meetings that they had during Margaret uh, Thatcher's time in power. Um, and it was all set in this, in a room in, um, in, uh, the queen's palace so the this back, back wall here is like inspired by um some of the actual pictures that i saw of um uh, of real life and um we actually on these panels we projected text and different dates as well to sort of pinpoint this because we jumped about in town in time a bit and there was some multi-rolling in that show as well so lots of different costume changes uh yeah and that there's two on the on the uh the ones sitting down are like the younger version of the Queen and Thatcher and then the ones stood up are like the older version so there's like two of each so that was that was a really really fun show to design. Um, this is a show called Where We Began. Um, each performer had a different slice of stage that they occupied and it was just, it was like five overlapping monologues um, and it was all about based on the concept of imagine if we all were sent back to where we were born. Um, so it's a quite a political piece. Uh, these big um, fluorescent lights in the back pinged on um, when it when their space was illuminated, when it was their uh, bit of monologue that they were saying. Um, so that again, that was to feel really bu uh, bureaucratic, just like the movie picture I showed you. And each of these squares on here, well, rectangles on here, is to represent, represent a piece of paper. So it was like a cascade of paper, and it was all about. Um, the kind of endless forms and red tape and form filling and letters um, that people experience, particularly um, when um, trying to um, uh, remain, uh, get leave to remain in the country. Um, this was a show that we actually did um, over Skype. Um, this was quite a few years ago, I think before Zoom existed or before Zoom was big, I'm not really sure when Zoom came out. Um, but yes, we had a lot of uh, te uh, technology to, um, to contend with on this because we were connected to um, Athens and Munich and the show was in London. Um, and so it was all projected so you could see on the screen, there's some people that, um, some performers there in, um, in Athens. And we were all performing the same script at once. And then um, some, uh, at some points we would uh, our performers would sit down and we just watch something that was happening in Munich and um, and vice versa um, and then this was another show at the gala Durham um, which is of teachers um, which is a, a comedy about some students um, so uh, doing a performance on the last day of, of school uh, so we created this stage on top of the stage uh, with these big fluorescent lights and um, these curtains that, that opened and all the um, scenes were created out of things you'd find just tucked away on an old school stage. So there was a lectern and a, some whiteboards and school chairs. So all the different locations were just actually created out of those things. 
Um, and then the last one I'll show you, this is a Vulture song. So this, this was um, by uh, Blah 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 Theatre Company, which is another children's theatre company. And um, so it was all uh, about the story of the partition of India, but told uh, through um, the vultures that were kind of picking over the um, the remains of um, of bodies, and it was quite quite grotesque for a children, but um, obviously it was a children's story, so it was kind of told uh, in a less grotesque way. Um, but yeah, there was these big um, trees that the that the vultures would uh, climb on as part of the show that were made out of um, scaffolding. Um, so just stop sharing for a sec. So that's just some of my work there. Um, and next I'm going to talk to you about like the process of, um, of designing a, a show and like all the different kind of stages. Um, uh, so first, um, obviously we get the script, if there is a script <laughs> at that point. Um, and we, um, the whole team will kind of look at that and um, uh, I guess d decide, we sort of create a brief ourselves, like what we want to do with it. Um, that's based on um, any like budget constraints. For example, we might only have 50 pound budget, or we might have a 5,000 pound budget. So that's gonna sort of uh, shape the brief as a first thing. Um, uh, we might have a certain, time period that we want need to portray or we might decide we want to set it in a different time period um, so we'll do kind of a lot of research on the topic for example um, if it's set in a certain place like I've got a show upcoming that's all set in Doncaster so there's some re and it's all about the nightlife from the 90s in Doncaster so there's that's a whole area that I'd go and research or um, maybe there's uh, maybe it's set in Edwardian times or Victorian times and all the 1930s so that would be an era to go and research or maybe it's set in India and that's a whole um, place of imagery we'd want to go and research and so we would um, I, how I generally work is I collect lots of images and use like Pinterest or um, or uh, do Google image searches and create documents with like, lots of images on um, uh, put share things on Dropbox. Um, some people use sketchbooks um, and collage images. Anything to create like a sense of the world. So that's what I would do first, and in order to kind of get some inspiration. Um, uh, as I say, we kind of we more meet as a team. So it would be um, the direct, mainly the director. Um, sometimes the writer might be present as well. Um, and then we talk about initial kind of ideas and as I say, create a brief for, for um, how we, how we uh, yeah, how, make an agreement <laughs> in uh, what, how we want to proceed with the design. Um, then I start sketching some ideas. It's be like really, really rough in my little notebook. Um, uh, and then we'd have more meetings um, and uh, kind of check in on progress. So this might take place over uh, several weeks or might even take place over several months depending on when the production is um, then we would make um, a white card model um, so uh, a white what a white card model is is like a draft model so it's the same as doing like a rough sketch it's like a rough model um, and what we do in terms of um, model making so this is a really big tool for um, uh, for communicating design um, is um, making a scale model and we work in one, one to 25. Um, so basically it's 25 times smaller than real life. That's what the one to 25 ratio is. Um, so I'll, I'll show you some bits. I've got some little, little odd bits. So for example, that's what a white card, uh, that's like a, a little platform from a white card model. And these are floorboards. So you can see like kind of roughly what the scale is here. Um, and when you get into the final model, that's kind of what that would look like so you've got uh the kind of rough which might even this was actually done on a computer program but you, that it could ease a white card model could easily be 
little bits of cardboard stuck together with masking tape and just got some squiggles on with some pencil so it can be really rough and it's just kind of getting a broad shape um and uh it's just in order to start playing in 3d which i actually find really useful um you can get little um i should have had one prepared one second <laughs> little people um that i like to put in a model that all of a sudden as soon as you get a little a little person that's one to 25 into a space you suddenly start to kind of see the landscape and understand three-dimensionally how it's going to work and how it's going to look and also what you can do if you've got things that are going to move in and out of a set you get to play a bit like a doll's house and people get really excited about small things and it's lots of directors and actors particularly are like ah you've brought the tiny model and you get to play. So you, when you do a scene change, you're like, well, this moves in and then it's going to do this and then it's going to do that. And um, it's a really good way of imagining it. Um, so once we've done that, we'll have a presentation. Um, and usually that's a, um, uh, with a, uh, many members of the team. You've, you've got the production manager in at this point who wants to know logistics of how it's all going to work. You um, have got... Um, a costume supervisor if you've got one on the production that you would show again you'd have rough costume drawings so um, a lot of the research that we've done is not only on kind of place it's on um, kind of style and era um, of, uh, of, of, cost, of the costumes of fashion of, of those times so we might have some sketches or it might be for costume it might be just images you've pulled off google um, or photocopied from books um or you might have you know a book on edwardian fashion and then you would sort of present that and point at things and so that people have got a broad idea of what you're kind of thinking for, for costume as well um so at that point um usually the production manager would go away and do a book do a budget um to see if they can actually we can actually afford it um and um uh, sometimes it comes in a bit over and they say, oh, you've got to make a couple of adjustments. You've got to lose this. Do we need this? And I'll be like, yes, of course we need that. <laughs> um, so it's about, um, it's about compromise at that stage. Um, so yeah, so there'll be final bits of model. I'll show you a couple of other bits. So this, that's well, a little bed um, that I made for, uh, with the 154 collective as well for production of under the bed. Um, this is a little whiteboard. Um, I'll just show it next to a person. Um, and this was, a, oops, this was created for um, uh, teachers that the show that I showed you with the green curtains. They had lots of wheel, um, whiteboards that wheeled on and off. Um, the other good thing about the model is that it, um, it's good for a director to like figure out like blocking and scene changes as well. So um, often uh, um, directors will say, can I just borrow the model for a few hours? And then they'll just sit there like playing again, like do it like a doll's house in order to kind of preempt some blocking. Um, so that once they have performers in front of them, they've got an idea how it's all going to work. Um, a model is, is created not just in space like this. We usually create um, a foam board, it's usually out of foam board, a uh, box that's usually like a black box, um, just with a back and a, and a floor and some sides that just have the kind of perimeter of the stage so that we know the dimensions that we've got to, to play with. And if it's all done exactly to scale, then once the set's all built, then it's all going to, you know, it's all going to fit perfectly and you know that you've got enough room to move around that scenery and you know how much room you've got for the actors to go in the winds or whatever because you've kind of calculated it all. Um, which brings me on to technical drawings. Um, so this is another kind of um, uh, a way of communicating design. So um, in order for them to... Um, uh, Oh, I just I've just seen a message in in, in a chat that was sent ages ago. Jim Cartwright, legend. I auditioned for that. Brilliant. <laughs> um, yes, really great show. Um, yeah. So back to the technical drawing. So um, uh, yeah, often set builders will need something um, really really accurate. So so te technical drawings. You never do it by hand with a scale ruler. Um, uh, this is a scale ruler. 
Um, it's got the different scales on it. As I say, the one we use is one to 25. But you can make models in, in one to 50 sometimes, uh, but one to 25 is like the, this kind of standard. So this is how we would do our drawing. Alternatively, we could do it on a computer program. So I've, um, in recent years, I've got with the modern times and I've learned AutoCAD and you can also use Vectorworks and that's a program for drawing. Um, and that's got all the, all the measurements on. So it's really, really accurate. And set builders really like it when you um, give them uh, the really accurate technical drawings because it makes it really easy to, to build everything from there and to calculate, you know, how it's going to be constructed and everything. Um, so yeah, so you submit all of that along with your beautiful costume designs that you've done alongside all of this, um, which can be done in many ways. It can be done with pencil and paint, uh, collage. A lot of people use Photoshop um, to collage bits of images together. Some people use like these posh pro marker felt tips. Some people, some people are really super expressive. Some are really, really detailed. So everybody kind of work, every designer has got a different style. Um, but the main, the main thing is just having all the information there in order to communicate it best. Um, because uh, I think design when it's on stage is about communicating ideas and a theme to an audience. But designing when it's uh, during the process is about communicating your ideas to the team. Um, so it's what best can I, what's the best way of me being able to, to communicate my ideas so it's going to be built correctly, so it's going to be painted correctly. That's why we'll have, you know, these, um, you know, you do a finish, a painted finish and a textured finish so that um, whoever's painting that is going to know exactly how to, um, how to construct that and how to paint it. Uh, so again, this is a little ladder that's from teachers as well. <laughs> and again, there's different materials that people use for model making. So this, this is made out of plastic, little bits of plastic. Um, this is made out of wire. This is a little chair. It's made out of wire and card. So there's different techniques um, and again designers use different techniques depending on what they feel comfortable with or they may employ a model maker and they can make the model. Um, so yeah so once we've presented all of that and we've communicated that efficiently then it's all about um, attending rehearsals, attending costume fittings, um, having meetings with the set builders, having meetings with the props department um, selecting props that you want to use. There's often a, a prop store within a theatre that you can go and raid. Um, speaking to stage management, um, uh, monitoring um, costumes being constructed and altering so that they fit correctly, um, and kind of keeping. You have pr frequent production meetings in order to. Um, keep an eye on anything that evolves because sometimes things come up in rehearsals. So um, they might say, oh, all of a sudden we need this new prop or this prop isn't working or we need it to do this or we need a, a glass to break on stage. And it's all about problem solving. So you're working with, st with stage management and the production manager um, in order to um, uh, keep track of the, the new things that are coming up in rehearsals. Um, so, and then we get into tech once we've done rehearsals and we've worked with the actors on stage and um, uh, we, um, tech is a very, I'm sure, I think most, some of you here have been in the tech and it's just going from cue to cue to cue, looking at lighting, uh, looking at sound, looking at the props on stage, looking at the, um, the finished costumes on the performers. And it's the point where everything all comes together and it's the point where everybody is collaborating all together and everybody's got an opinion and you're all trying to, to make it, um, make all the vision really cohesive and for everything to function like logistically as well. So yeah, so it's the point of which we see everything at what, finally in 
large scale. So obviously we've spent so long with these little tiny things that we get to a point where we can actually see it in large scale. And it's for a designer, that's one of the most exciting points where you can actually walk on your set or sit on your set um, and you're, you've spent months, hours and hours, and, uh, and hours, the, you know, the early hours of the morning, like staring at a tiny little model, and you can actually see um, see it all um, created. And at that point, you're looking at little details, and you go, "Oh, the back of that isn't painted, or those trouser legs are too long; they need taking up." And you start obsessing over those details, and it's just writing little notes in books during the whole tech session. And then you generally have meetings um, throughout just to iron out those details. Um, then we move on to um, to previews. Um, previews are a point where we can make changes, um, little changes if we need to. So, for example, something we might realise something's not working, um, and uh, we've got a bit of time to, as long as it's not a huge change, we've got little time to modify things. So I've had things added or I've changed the colour of something. Um, uh, sometimes even bits of writing or scenes uh, changed um, as well during that preview period as well because actually putting it in front of an audience you're like hmm that didn't actually work in the way that we wanted it to. So it becomes yeah a point where we can um, have a little bit of time to alter up until press night and then press night is when we all have a big party. <laughs> Everyone finally can breathe a sigh of relief that it's all on. And, um, and yeah, it's often a bit of a sad time for designers because you've spent so long with the performers, you've spent so long with the team and you've made this little family. And working freelance, you, you have a new little family every, every month, every couple of months when you work on a new production. And um, the actors are like, you're going, you're going already. <laughs> and then uh, you have to say goodbye to everybody. And it, and it, sometimes the actors just expect you're going to stay on the tour but, and, or, or for the rest of the run. But really, that's the point where we say goodbye because um, our work is done. So it's usually press night. It's my last day in a production. And I'll sign everything off and be happy. I might come see it a bit further down the line if it's a long run. If it's just a handful of shows, then um, I usually don't get the opportunity. Um, but yeah, if it's a long run or if it's touring, a lot of my work tours, and it's really great to go and see it in a different venue. Um, and so, uh, yeah, as long as you're not, um, you don't start saying, mm, this needs changing, <laughs> like two months down the line, you've got to try and hold your tongue and just kind of accept it for what it is at that point. Um, yeah, so that's so that's that. So that's all the process. Um, uh, I thought I'd do just a quick little name a job, name a theatre job, and I'll tell you how we as designers collaborate with that person because I believe that out of everybody on the whole of the team, although Lisa might disagree, but I think that designers are the ones that collaborate with everybody or the most people. Um, uh, so can I, can we like unmute everybody and someone just shout out a, um, so name a theatre job, a theatre, uh, person within that, the, uh, the process, anybody that works in the theatre and I'll tell you how we collaborate with them. <laughs> Lighting technician. Oops. Lighting technician. Um, yeah. so you have to get on the right side of a lighting technician because, and I learned this uh, on one of my first days at university, that um, they can change the colour of your set and costume by just illuminate, putting a certain light on. Um, so, so um, obviously we work with lighting designers to, uh, they come to all the meetings in order to know what they're lighting. Um, but with the yeah the lighting technicians yeah it's all about those little details about color about how about focus about how things because all of that is you know there's a, a set is nothing without a light without a beautiful lighting design because that really shows off its assets or or you know helps helps realism sometimes or makes something really heightened and more theatrical 
um, it might hide some dodgy paintwork or it might illuminate some amazing paintwork. Um, so yeah, so so yes, we will we will definitely get on the right side and be best friends with the lighting technicians. <laughs> right, what else have we got? Choreographer. What was that? Choreographer. Choreographer. So yeah, um, so both choreographers and, and movement directors um, will collaborate with um, a lot to do with costume actually, um, because the number of times where I've designed a costume and then the choreographer's gone, oh, well, he needs to stick his leg in the air and you can't do that with those wool trousers. And so you go, right, okay, let's problem solve a way that we can uh, put an, uh, an insert of elastic or lycra or something into that crotch or reinforce something. Um, or there might be a... Um, a quick change or a reveal of a costume there might be something that's underdressed and we might kind of work we might work with the choreography to see if that can be a beautiful piece of choreography that might reveal that costume change or um or or hide a costume change um so yeah there's lots to do with that and i think also like you've got to think when you're designing costume about how it's going to move as well and so you might say, right, what are you planning for this big dance scene? And they might, you might identify a specific type of fabric that might complement that movement really well, like something that will float in a certain way, for example. Uh, right, any more? What about a director? A director. So that's who we collaborate with the most. So the director and the designer out of, out of everybody work super close um, and we will have those very first meetings together we will have those m slaving over the model box like figuring out like the adjustment of exactly where everything goes and that's who everything goes through really is how um, uh, is, is the director we um, I think a lot of people I think some people think that the director like tells us what to do and that it's like this you need to do this and that they've got this vision um, and I'm sure there are some directors out there that are, are very uh, are very specific about what they want but I think it's always a collaboration it's always um, the director always um, uh, a good director anyway will always kind of trust your knowledge as a third designer um, and uh, your experience um, but yeah, it's it's often often they will, like, look, they'll really really influence something as well and uh, come up with something. They'll look at the model and they'll come up with something I never thought of. So it's all really symbiotic relationships that you're kind of feeding off each other and getting really excited about ideas. So yeah, that's the most important and closest relationship. Uh, right, we've got one more. So I think there was two. I think there was one from Matt and then one from Casey. All right, we'll have them both. What was Matt's? Uh, what about like the people who are in charge of the sound? Uh, sound people. Yeah, so often um, we'll need to c collaborate with them about things like radio mics or um, sometimes a, a mic has to go into a, into a wig or it might be under a costume or it might need, you might need a, a, a pouch, might have to be, for the mic pack might need to be integrated into the costume. Um, or they might say that, that um which i think like uh in order to like mask a speaker like i've done that loads before um so in a piece of set um like a fake piano they often have that and they want to put a, they want to put a speaker inside the piano so it sounds like the sound's coming from there uh or you might have a prop that you want to like in, embed a, a speaker or something or even a microphone into i've done that before on that picture that i showed you of um instructions for border crossing with all the security barriers that were around the edge and um, we actually had little contact microphones like within that so whenever we opened the barrier whoop, you'd hear that noise and it would have a load of reverb on it so that noise whoop, would like echo across the space uh, so yeah that's also a good collaboration um, and what was the last one who was that um, costume designer or the costume team costume so i would um do the costume designs on my show. Although on some productions, like some big ballets and some 
operas um that that is diff there are different um so there might be a separate costume designer to the set designer but i generally do both but a big collaboration is with the costume supervisor who would look after the costumes so they would um based on my designs they'd um create a rail of options um uh and then we would go through that before we went into fittings we would say oh, i like that i don't like that or um uh, or we would go shopping together if we were buying st stuff that was modern day um or if they make stuff it's a, um they would work with the, with their um team in order to um they'd like to, to create costumes from scratch so it's the, all of that is a big collaboration because you really need, you kind of trust them to realize your vision based on your drawings but um yeah it's um that's a very very close relationship and actually often like i was i was supposed to be doing um a production with over 100 people in this summer but it's obviously been cancelled because of um corona um but that yeah we were planning me and the costume supervisor we were planning on being on the phone like on a whatsapp and stuff every single day because we knew that in order to costume 100 people who all had at least two costumes it would just have to be constant. What do you think of this? I found this. I'm in Primark. What do you think of this? I'm in this charity shop. Does this look right? Um, so yeah, that's really close. Collaboration film. Anyway, so yes, everybody, everybody, we have a great uh, close relationship with, um, and um, and of course, there's the actors as well, which um, are sometimes a joy and sometimes a pain. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, who will always have opinions on 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 everything on on oh, everything that they have to do every prop everything that they have to wear so um uh that's a great collaboration as well because we need to make sure that they're really comfortable for example you don't want to send somebody out on stage with shoes that don't fit or so you really need to like listen to their concerns and take all that on board um uh yeah so that's that god i've rattled on lots but um we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna do um a little quiz uh in a sec just um as something for you guys to do um but the, just the last thing i'll say on that is um that the process um for designing uh a show isn't always just exactly like that um, because sometimes because it sounds like it's all very neat and everything's done in advance and we're all very organized but sometimes it doesn't really work like that because often the show that we're working on has not been written yet. It's, it's might be devised, so we might be coming up with it in the room together in rehearsal. So I might turn up on the first day of rehearsals and I won't have my beautiful model box at all because we don't know what the show is. So I'll be designing on the fly. So we might not have time to even make a model. It might be based on, I might just be doing sketches. I might just be bringing stuff into the rehearsal room as we go. Um, so, yeah it's the process does change depending on uh how new the show is um also a piece of new writing um the the writer might be making adjustments throughout so things are constantly evolving and changing so it's very reactive like reacting to all of that it's only i think when you've got a script far in advance and often if you're working for a big uh bigger kind of organization or theater that you would um uh have the kind of luxury of doing everything really really far in advance but actually sometimes it is nice to design to 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 have things evolving and changing as you go because um you can kind of influence things as a designer because on the first day of rehearsals i could come in with a prop and be like oh i want to try out this and that might actually really influence how the writing goes so we can have more of a kind of impact uh on like shaping the final product um so yeah and also there's there's it you might want to create a set that isn't so naturalistic um it, you might want to create something that's really conceptual so you might not be as simple as bringing in some naturalistic props like your set might not even need any of that it might be your set might be a a big sand pit for example and that's the only thing that's on stage so you don't have that thing oh the set needs building and we need to meet all these people and da, da, da. because yeah the actors might just be in their underwear in this big sand pit and so we don't need to have all the rest of that process 
um, because you kind of, yeah, you're abstracting everything and simplifying everything and it might be really, really minimal. Um, so you won't need all those costume fittings and there might not be a costume supervisor, for example. Um, right, so that's enough of that. Um, so <laughs> uh, Obviously I get really excited about it because I'm really passionate about the world of theatre, but um, uh, we're just gonna do a little quiz. I'm just really interested to see what people know about theatre. Um, so should we unmute everyone again? Are you right to do that, Shazia? Sorry. I don't have the powers on my, hello. Right, so I say, well, let's see, yell the answers out. Some of these are based on what I've talked about. Um, it's, I'm not telling you. Um, but yeah, let's see what you know. So, um, what's the difference between stage left and auditorium left? So just shout it out, if you know. They're the opposite of each other. Yeah, so what's, which one is, if you're stage in the audience, if you're on stage, where's left? <laughs> it's on your left-hand side, but it's right to the audience. Yeah, so often, I mean, even people that have been in theatre for a long time still go, someone in the audience, like a director might go, go left, and it's like, no, my left, not your left. Um, so yeah, auditorium left is, if you're sitting in the audience, it's your left. So yes, well done. Um, what does breaking down a costume or piece of set mean? Breaking down. Taking away, packing up. No, that's a good guess though. Um, it's, I'll tell you, it's making something dirty or old looking. So if we say, if I say, oh, those trousers need breaking down, it's, that those trousers look too nice. So uh, <laughs> often a, um, uh, the, myself or um, a member of the costume department will get a cheese grater. That's a, big, <laughs> big, that's a common thing that we use, the cheese grater and we'll grate it down or we'll get some paint and make something look old and worn. Um, which might not even be, you might not even be trying to say, oh, this person's dirty. It's just so, a piece of clothing that you bought, you've bought just last week uh, might be beautiful and pristine and neat. And actually you want to make it look like it's been in the wash a few times and somebody's, you know, it's that lived in. So yeah, that's what breaking down is. Um, what is a traverse stage? What does that mean? A stage that can be moved during the production, maybe? <laughs> good, good guess, has anyone else got a guess? Uh, one with wings that projects out into the audience? Yeah, sort of, pretty much. Yeah, it's when you've got the audience on two sides. So you've got a long uh, stage space and then the audience on, on either side. So that's another thing that we come up with is um, uh, we might want to change the audience layout. Um, so we might decide that the audience that uh, we might want to put it in the round and the audience all around or we might want to put it in thrust which means that the audience is on three sides that might be dictated to us already by the um, by the space that we're in um, for example York my local theatre York Theatre Royal I work quite a lot in their studio and that's in thrust so you've got the audience on three sides so you always have to keep that in mind because you've got to think about sight lines. If you put a massive piece of set in the middle, then some of the audience might aren't going to see. So yeah, so, but traverse, yeah, is audience on either side. Um, what scale do we work in? Remember? 125. 125, yes, well done. <laughs> um, what is the arch called in an end on? So end on is like the conventional kind of layout. What is that arch called that a lot of old theatres have? Proscenium. Yes, proscenium. So that's <laughs> a lot of um, the Victorian theatres, you'll get a proscenium arch. Um, what is a raked stage? Sloped. Sloped, yes. Extra point for what, what percent? <laughs> no. <laughs> No, I don't know either. I, I did actually figure this out for a show I was doing recently that there are different gradients and apparently different countries use different gradients. 
right um yeah so so this is what you've got to um you, do you remember the show i was talking about teachers that had all the whiteboards that were on wheels <laughs> yeah well um it toured and it toured to a venue that had a raped stage so, <laughs> so um they tried their best to what they call anti-rake, which is the, the platform that we had. They tried to, to um, counteract the weight, the, the rake, so that it was flat. Because otherwise, the, imagine on a slope, you're, <laughs> the whiteboards are going to be sliding off the stage and be awful to contend with, and the actors would never forgive you. So yes, that's where a rake stage is. Uh, and last one, what is the point of a preview performance? Uh, to fit in people who couldn't... Uh... Who can't afford to attend the full prize one? <laughs> yeah, well, that is true, and that is a, it does provide a brilliant opportunity. Um, uh, but the reason it's a bit cheaper is because, as I said earlier, we're, 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 make, we're making a few changes still. We're still figuring it out. Um, I've I worked on a lot of shows where the, the first preview is a completely different show to the one that you do on press night because all of a sudden the writers have gone, this is terrible. I'm going to change the ending. <laughs> um, so yeah. Um, so well done. Uh, brilliant. I feel like you all have a good grasp of, um, of some of the theatre terminology already. Um, right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some pictures of like a process. Uh, I'm just aware of time because I want to do a little activity as well. I'm going to show you some pictures of a process on my PowerPoint of um, the show I designed a couple of years ago. Um, um, and that'll just help kind of uh, contextualise like a bit of the, the process that I've um, described. Um, and then we're going to do uh, a quick, um, that quick exercise that I said, uh, said, said we would do earlier. Um, and then we'll do, if anyone's got any questions, um, and then we'll, um, and then that'll probably take us to the end. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen again if I can do this. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna take you through. So this is from 2017, a couple of years long ago. This is a production of Pygmalion that I did at the English Theatre Frankfurt. Does everybody know the story of Pygmalion? So it's basically My Fair Lady. Uh, so it's about um, a young uh, working class girl who is taught to speak proper, English by a man called Henry Higgins who's got a bet with his friend that he can make her passable as um, a, a high class woman. I didn't design this graphic image by the way. <laughs> I think it's a very strange advertising image um, and it's nothing to do with me because they'd done that before I came on board. Um, yes, but yes, so Pygmalion. Um, so what I will say is that I sometimes make spreadsheets <laughs> as a designer. It sounds really boring, but I'll go through each scene when I've, when I've read it and I'll write down everything that's needed in that scene. And it helps me kind of grasp like what, what you, we need on stage for it to be like really uh, to function and what we need to tell the story and what we can strip away. So this is just an example of a, like a sort of spreadsheet that I'd make going through each scene. Um, and writing um, money, armchair, things like that. So you know what needs to be present on screen, on, on, on stage, sorry, in order to make it work. Um, and then we create the design brief that I talked about. So this, um, we decided it needs to be period appropriate because that story is set in 1913, uh, contain multiple locations, have quick scene transitions, contain all the, furniture props that I did on my spreadsheet that's vital for each scene's action. Demonstrate the class system of the time. That was really important for this, um, this play particularly. Show Eliza's transformation. So she goes from being really poor to being wealthy or at least looking wealthy. Um, fit the given space, which is the English Theatre Frankfurt and um, stay within budget. <laughs> so uh, we've got these are the things that from the first meeting with the with the production manager and the the director we were like this is our design brief and now we've got this in our heads we know how to proceed from here um so this is the space so i went to visit the space this isn't my set this isn't 
a show of spam a lot that was in the space but this is in frankfurt so i i flew out to frankfurt in order to to have a, a look at space and see what we were dealing with so i took a load of pictures so we went kind of had, had an idea of um what what canvas i had to work with these are some research images so these are you know i said we collect images and we you know put them on pinterest or we make pdfs so these are just of the world so i knew kind of what we were dealing with the period um and then here was some this is another thing that we do for inspiration is we look at um art and architecture um so this there was something about the windows that were just there's some windows described in 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 the drawing um uh, you know, in a drawing room, there were some windows described. Um, and they quite excited me. And I thought, hmm, maybe there's something we could do with windows. And this led me on to looking at Charles Rennie Macintosh, the um, artist, who actually was working around the same time in that kind of period. So I knew that that's what was going to inspire me for these um, ideas, uh, for this design. Um, so this is some of the some of the imagery. Um, this is Macintosh's house that you can go visit. I didn't actually uh, go on a research trip there, but I got some images. So all of this was like influencing me. Um, this is some Mondrian as well, um, and it was these lines. Um, something about these lines that I knew I wanted to incorporate into the design. Um, there's certain real places that are mentioned as well. Um, so this they, this is. Um, uh, uh, in Comet Garden, they were they actually referenced some of these locations. So I started trying to mimic some of these locations in my model. So you see, this is in the bottom corner. That's like that's my white, that's my rough white card model. You know, I said you start playing with shapes and things in a model, and then you st I started sketching. Um, and there was something about again these windows that I wanted to create, but because we're moving location all the time, I wanted to make sure each each time there was something changing within these windows that something was 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 moving we were letting light in we were we were closing the space down we were opening the space up so this is some really early sketches of how we might um how we might change the space um but with this idea of these windows um, again these are some rough these are 125 but they're just done with pencil uh, rather than on a fancy program um this is again working in white card, so I'm just getting my my felt tip pen and get always put a person in there, and that gets an idea, get, gives you an idea of the um, the uh, the scale of it really um, in in um, in relation to an actual person. Um, so we in the play, there's a there's two upstairs rooms. There's um a little flat that Eliza has at the beginning, and there's um a a bathroom and the bathroom seems really important because it's when Eliza first gets a wash so I knew I wanted them to be up high so I thought mm, I wonder if there's a way I can uh, have a little um, a little uh, hidden platform that gets revealed as part of these windows and again I was just playing with different ways it can open up uh, again this is looking at props for the prop for the um, the uh, props manager at, at the theatre so I was sending him all this in order to, to source. That's all the props. Um, so this was my first um, uh, stage of my final model, because I decided I was really set on these windows. Charles, Charles Rennie Macintosh inspired. Um, and then I, I looked at it and I went, it's too black, it's too oppressive. I don't like it. Um, and, so, and so I went in the garden and I spray painted it and I changed it. Um, and uh, this is me colour matching. So I was communicating with the production manager in Frankfurt with some paint samples. Um, and um, so that's what we ended up with at the end. This is me set, setting the model box up um, in, the, in my um, old house, in my lounge, ready for the director to come around for, um, for a meeting and for the grand unveiling of the final model. Um, so yeah, this is the final model with some little furniture bits um, and sort of looking at the transitions of how everything's going to work. Bits of furniture. So obviously we were playing with how the furniture would come on and off because the scene changes are so quick. It was like, right, how are we going to, how are we going to bring everything on and off really quickly? 
we're gonna have to use the performers, we're gonna have to have things on wheels. So we played with all of that in advance in the model and decided exactly all the doors that everything was gonna come through. So again, um, this is the ground plans that I was talking about. So this is on, um, this was done in AutoCAD. So this is showing the, um, exactly how it's gonna fit onto their stage. Um, so we knew how much room we'd have left in the wings. And then we knew which way the doors were going to open. And this was all um, uh, help for the, um, the technicians in how to build it and how to put it on stage. For the um, costumes, this is another, I made another bloody spreadsheet, which is um, just so I can get my head around how long they had for each, because the, um, there was lots of multi-rolling um, and lots of different days, so lots of costume changes. So I needed to get my head around how they, um, how much time they had between each um, costume change. So we, so I knew how much different each costume could be. Because if they only had uh, two lines of dialogue or, you know, two minutes, you can't really do a whole costume change, but we might be able to do, oh, we could do an overcoat then or we could put a hat on. But if we've got a bit more, we could do a bit more of a costume change and maybe do a, a complete change of costume. So that's what I did here. We're making lists for the, for the costume supervisor. Um, we also had wigs in the show as well. So I did some wig research and we had a wigs person. We also had hats. So we, sort of, hats were really big in the um, in Edwardian times. Um, and then these are some of my costume drawings. So this is showing the changed Eliza's um, transitions into, uh, she's getting dressed up by these men that are paying for all these beautiful outfits for her. Um, so this is kind of her evolution. Um, so this is using my costume references and drawings. Um, okay, this is my model box all packed up. So obviously it was in Frankfurt, so I had to travel over with the model. And then this is an example of a door that the that the um, production manager had um, got the the uh, set building team to make. And again, he'd done it in black. And I said, no, we've changed. I've changed my mind. It's not black anymore. <laughs> Um, and these are the, what this is what a call sheet looks like. So it's got all the um, the list of everything um, that we're going to do in the day, and including costume fittings. So I was darting between sitting in rehearsals, having meetings, having costume fittings, and then this is um, them um, building the set. So this is seeing it finally. You know that feeling I said when we finally get to go on the set, that amazing feeling, and that's me actually stood in on top of the set so that was really amazing to do that um and then we've got some costume fittings so this is her we actually added a belt on this this is something that we added in the previews we added a black belt onto her dress and then this is tech so this is what tech looks like with the big tech desks um for sound and lighting um and then they're focusing lights and then the actors get to go on stage for the first time um i just did a spot of flower arranging uh in the middle of tech just to chill me out because it's very stressful <laughs> the props manager said um, do you want to make these flower displays i said yes i do that sounds like a brilliant job so i made those i went to the flea market with the costume person just to get some little lots of little details of jewelry and things so i had fun doing that and then um this is the final show um you know, I said we changed things in the previews. The other thing we changed was the colour of this desk because I said, oh, it's too light. Um, so we ended up painting it, but I don't have those because the photos were taken in, in the previews. So from press night onwards, the show was on for a month, I think. Um, it, it was darker. So yeah, this is how it worked. And you can see here, like how all the doors opened um, to create the different rooms. Um, this is at the beginning on the street. And this is her little room at the top that opens seamlessly. Um, and there was all the costumes, period specific. That's the bathroom that opened up at the top, on the top right. And that's this big ballroom scene with, this, with my flowers that I did at the back. <laughs> And as I say, yeah, we added that black belt on after, but I've not got it in my photos. 
And this is just to show how different that space looked with different lighting, different coloured lighting. So that was Pygmalion. So that was taking us through the whole process. I was to say, it's such a big, long, um, big, long process of collaboration with so many different departments, so many different people. Um, but um, yeah, that's sort of contextualising it in, in terms of a production that I've done. Um, so basically what we're just going to do for the last um, 20 minutes um, is we're going to have a look at um, a bit of script um, which and a bit of a synopsis of a, um, this is a production that I designed actually last year um, and uh, it's of The Boy Who Cried Wolf which is a children's um, production with Tutti Fruity Theatre Company and um, it's got a little bit of um, dialogue um, at the beginning that kind of sets the sets up the world. And then it's got um, a description of each scene and the location. Um, so what, uh, what I would love, um, if you're up for it, is um, if we can pop you into some groups. So if we do like three groups or, uh, or yeah, let's do three groups. Um, yeah, if everyone could just have a read of it and then not, not to design it, because we're not designing it, it's a long process of, as we've uh, described, but just to talk about how we might approach designing it. So for example, um, thinking about the different locations, because there's so many different locations, how would you design it? Would you design it naturalistically? Would you come up with like a big crazy concept? Or the, you know, is it, is it all in a sand pit? Is it all up a mountain? Is it all in the snow? Like, um, how yeah how naturalistic would you go how concept driven is it what are some initial things that you think oh maybe this maybe the design can uh, the design language can be all about such such um i don't want to give you any ideas but um I'd, but I'd love to hear your ideas um so we're all happy to is that all really clear is everyone and then um we'll just feed back some thoughts so yeah about 10 minutes Has everyone got any thoughts? Yeah. Go for it. <laughs> Go for Anna. Me and Michael thought that it might be interesting to have like this sort of um, stages where uh, it's a round stage, so it, it moves, it has the potential to move. Ah, great. And it has this di division in the middle. Yeah. So, like when we are seeing this scene, the scene at the back can be set as a different space or a different environment, or it can even be used like this so that we have like maybe two, two different spaces that are, um, are being shown at the same time. And yeah, we, yeah. well, you, do you want to tell about lighting, Michael? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we saw the lighting has been very important to differentiate between a cosy, like cluttered environment on one side, which is nice and warm and cosy, where they were all knitting. And the fact that outside would be a lot starker and exposed. So like you're trying to use the lighting to give an impression of uh, cold and cold and warmth, um, maybe, Maybe internally we could have a log fire or something like that as well. Yeah, nice. Yeah, yeah. I, that's really great that you've picked upon them. Um, like obviously the different temperatures. It's really cold and stark in the mountains, and then the kind of contrast between that and being like warm and cozy in the house. Because um, that is a big thing, isn't it? That for for him, for Silas, being out in the mountains, cold and alone, that's the reason why he... Yeah, yeah he but we tried cold. to convey, like, the coziness and the safety. Yeah. Like, I know being inside was, like, safe, and, like, being outside was exposed. We said exposed a few times. Yeah. Ah, oh, great. Brilliant. Great ideas. Um, thank you so much, guys. And then we've got... Yeah, do you want to go for it? Yeah, hi. I was with Becky in the room, um, and so we we had a couple of ideas um, 
Becky, please feel free to pitch in if, if you want to, uh, please. Yeah, sure. um, about the stage sets, because obviously there seem to be two quite distinct scenes, like the last group said, uh, with the outside and inside. And we sort of, would, uh, um, I suggested we could do something with roller blinds, with scene painted on, so you would just put the blinds up or the blinds down to get the two different That's nice. uh, scenes. Which would Done be that before, like, actually. <laughs> have you? Oh, wow, okay, so that'd be quite cheap. <laughs> and we're then trying to think about obviously using different lighting to try and give them sort of, uh, and the different colours would obviously give you the um, the temperature and how it feels whether it's inside or outside. And I, and I think um, we've seen the costume changes because people are playing multiple roles might be really fast. So I think Becky yeah, said, I think it said there's only three actors with multi at the start. Right, yeah, they're so all thinking how to like quickly signify that change of role and also because they're having to change from human to animals in some instances. So mm -hmm. we're talking about maybe masks for to represent that quick change um, would be an easy way to negotiate that you wouldn't have much time to do a costume change with only three actors yeah. moving around stage. Yeah. And especially if you read the script in full, there's like no time. You know, I said in my <laughs> script earlier, I was looking at how much time, you know, there's no, it literally goes from one to the next. Um, so yeah, that's great that you've identified that. One of the things I was thinking, you know, when you go to theme parks and you have cutouts and you just stick your head through, you know, being a wrestler <laughs> or an animal. So, to have a better sort of version of that with the actual wool and stuff, so a bit more 3D and you could just pop your head through, <laughs> then it was like... <laughs> <laughs> that's really clever, that's really clever, I like that, yeah. Particularly with the bits okay. being really short, you could imagine them sort of popping their heads through and then... <laughs> yeah, that's really fun. Okay. Oh, thank yeah. you, that's, that's excellent. Um, and the other group? Is it Matt? Me and Matt, yeah. <laughs> We, I, I got really carried away with the with the wool, um, as as a as the context and the prop and stuff. And I was thinking about that really thick wool you use to knit with your arms. You know when people make those really thick blankets. And I was I was thinking about like using really thick wool as sort of part part of the set and and the props, and then being able to sort of like pull it and use it for yeah. different things. And then and then Matt took that to another level, didn't you, Matt? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I was talking about like the sheep could be just covered in this wool and, and over time then they, it becomes a wolf and then, then, then kids dressed as wind and just running back and forth all the time. <laughs> oh, nice. We like, we like the idea of having a, a sheep and, and that, that sheep being wrapped in this wool and that as the knitting happens, you're knitting directly off the sheep. And oh, so, <laughs> so you kind of... It's just getting thinner and thinner. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, that's what I meant earlier about um, like picking like a visual language. Is it, it often is that in design where you go, uh, right, wool, like you've done, and you run with that, and you're like, that's the theme. That's what we. That's uh, how how do we imagine every scene and every costume change and every character starting from wool. Um, so yeah, that's that's really brilliant. And actually, that's that's kind of what I did. I, I, mm -hmm. I went with knitting. I went what what feels important in this world it's the wall it's the knitting because it's all about the sheep up the mountain the reason they've got the sheep is is so that they can shear them and get the wool so it's like this whole village the whole ecology of the village is all based on wool and knitting and these um the the, the little bit the villagers they're like constantly knitting so yeah it was wool for me i, I like and, this i oh sorry no go on go on so I like this idea of when it ends and she wins like when the curtains come down it's just this huge woolen jumper what what just falls down and then a massive <laughs> a massive roar <laughs> and all the light just shines on this huge woolen jumper. Oh, that's amazing! That's beautiful. Um, I can't. We're about the end of the session. Um, I can either, if you want to stay on for thirty seconds, I can show you what I did. Not that it's right because in any of this, it's not like. Well, you're wrong and what I did was that because everybody's got a different interpretation that's why you see you know there's like hundreds of thousands probably versions of like Shakespeare plays for example and they're all done in completely different ways and none of their version is right it's all just a different kind of take on it um uh, so I can even show you or um or you can just look at my website later because I don't want to keep you um so what uh I'd like I'd like to see 
Yeah. 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 Uh, all right, so I can, I can show you on, power, on my PowerPoint. I'm going to share screen again. Right, can you see? Mm. Right, so what we did was, because um, uh, this was a really small touring show, so it wasn't, uh, we didn't, uh, it wasn't a huge, massive budget or anything, so it was quite scaled back. But what, for me, it was the wool, it was the knitting, and it was the trees, because we, we go, um, uh, actually, I didn't put it in that ex in that um, excerpt that I uh, that I gave you, but they're all constantly going through the forest to get to the mountains. Um, so we had we had these trees, and it's coming up these bobbins, these these giant bobbins. It's all part of this like the knitting and the wool world, and all the trees are covered in yarn, and there's mountains at the back which are made of knitting. Um, and for, so the for the costume for the old. Uh, for the villagers it was just these scarves and it literally was really quick to put on but still even in tech they were going it's taking too long because that's how quick that they wanted that scene change it was literally throwing a scarf on um so they were able to use these bobbins to sit on they opened up and they had um storage prop storage in there um we had a little lamp uh, a little light hanging off one of the trees which was for inside the house when we were inside the house we switched that little light on a little light hang hanging down um and we had for the village we had these little houses that were illuminated so we could show the village um so it was like the village the forest and the mountains and the home we were able to show really quickly between them um we had some snow that we chucked around these are the sheep <laughs> little sheep cats so yeah similar to you guys saying we just whack on a mask Sim similar we just uh they were sort of like hip-hop they had these like hip hop dancing and they were sort of had a lot of swagger um so that's why it's these sort of like these hats with these big ears that cut floppy that really kind of complemented all of that and then the back was like a star you can see the little fairy lights at the back was like stars in the sky and then this is again how lighting can change this is when we're hearing about the wolves it's all red so that obviously must massively changes the space um and then within the trees we had little um fairy lights that were hidden in the trees um so these pinged on um at the end for the dance uh for the big celebration at the end um and uh these bunting they came out of one of the bobbins um and got strung between so this was like the kind of party atmosphere um so that's that as i say nobody's right or wrong but that's just, that's what i did and that's how we kind of with the rest of the team that's the kind of direction that we wanted to go in but yeah it was it was knitting it was non it was non non naturalistic we went trying to be really specific about we're going to wheel in you know a big bit of set that is a living room it was all just very 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 quick so it was so quick between the between the scenes um so there we go so thank you so much and thanks for staying a couple of minutes after um if anyone's got any questions okay. Uh, if you want to look at any more of my work, um, on my website, it's just hannahsibaya.co.uk. Um, and if you think of any questions further down the line, then you can chuck them at me as well, because I'm um, always to help, always happy to help with um, anything that anybody has got to ask. So, yeah, is, if there's anything now, let me know. If not, then... Yes, there are questions. What is the process like if it's a small team and a small budget? And I, I assume that Anna can um, speak a bit more about that. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, so, so as I said earlier, we don't often have the luxury of having all the departments and a big budget to work with because it was quite a big budget on Pygmalion that I, um, that I showed you. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, often like I might go and do the costume shopping or um, I might uh, do the, do the propping. Um, it, uh, or um, if it's small, but uh, yeah, if we've not got much budget, it's we're being inventive with like what we've got. So somebody might say, "Oh, we've got this that might we could repurpose," or um, or I don't know. You kind of um, you work, you find new parameters. A lot of new parameters are created from um, being. You've got to be resourceful with like uh, a small amount of money or whatever. You sort of I don't know. A lot of really good designs actually come from like having like not much money and that, that kind of being a challenge um 
But yeah, you often just have to be really minimal and go, well, actually, I know this play has got six different locations, but we don't, we just don't have the money to realise all of those. So what we're going to do is just have a really basic, really beautiful gesture of a design. And you might just be like, I'm just going to have an orange circle on stage and then that's going to help just kind of at least give like the emotion and then we can just imagine the rest. As long as you're taking the audience on a journey, you don't have to have all the bells and whistles of, um, you know, big, massive set pieces moving in and out and expensive, crazy costume changes. It, you know, you can be really minimal and really simple. Like, I'm not sure if that answers the question, but... Um, yeah. yeah, I think as I, if I have understood it right, it's like the more budget you have, the more you maybe become a bridge between um, uh, the different sort of like uh, expertise. So you're the bridge between light designer, costume design, set design, but the less budget, the more you have to be all of these people, I well, guess. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and I do, and I do do both. And if I do a fringe, small fringe show, for example, yeah, I'll be I'll be the one that's running around the shops, um, and um, and I like doing both because sometimes sometimes you can feel quite distant from a project if you've got a massive team they're all working away and you're kind of you're going oh well I've done my work now because I've done, I've done the model and I've done those meetings and I'm just waiting for it all to happen now, um, so yeah it does it does vary but yeah you're absolutely right the the less money there is and the smaller the team the more hands on that you are <laughs> yeah. Do you want to say anything as a as a last thing, Hannah? Um, just thanks for coming, um, and I hope that's been useful. Uh, and I was a lot of talking. And usually, if we were all in the same room, then we could like break off and do things, and it'd be really hands on. Because I do a lot of like ha hands on. You know, we could actually try a bit of model making, or we could, you know, actually try a bit of making mood boards or whatever. Um, so I know it's a bit more difficult in the in the. Uh, the age of the coronavirus but um but yes but thank you for listening and um all your great ideas um so yeah thanks thank you hannah thank you for saying yes thank to being you, part hannah. of extracurricular i hope you all have a lovely evening and uh, i'm gonna send you guys off thank you everybody Bye.